What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the No Rain, No Rainbows podcast. Man, I'm excited for this one. Uh, I, no further ado, but as always, uh, shout out to my executive producer, Andre Suttles, Subtle Solution Media, for helping to make this podcast possible. Today, we have fat loss expert for entrepreneurs and business builders, author of The Million Dollar Body Method. You see it over his right shoulder. He's holding it up. My man came prepared. Ladies and gentlemen, Nate Palmer on the podcast. How you doing, Nate? What's up, man? I'm so good. I'm really excited to jump in today. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And uh, before we jump in, as our listeners and faithful fans know that I let the guest introduce themselves and get acquainted with the audience really quick, I always feel like I could introduce you, but I'd rather it come out of your mouth from your own words so I don't mess it up. That way that people can tell that I'm like, it's kind of just a self-aggrandizing like asshole. I want them <laughs> exactly. to know that ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> introduce yourself, brother. All right. So I, I really like... I, when I say like, oh, I am a fat loss expert. I just sound so pretentious when I do that. So I'll tell you like, I'm a dad. I got two little kids at home. I'm a husband. I've been married about 10 years. I love adventure and travel. And I, I love working on my business. And I love like, I love connecting with people. So none of that stuff has to do with fitness or health, but that is kind of an avenue that I've taken to make everything in my life better. It's a force multiplier for me. So I want to share that message with as many people as possible, which is why I wrote the book on, uh, on like kind of the entrepreneurial's diet, entrepreneur's diet for superhuman focus and rapid fat loss. Cause I just want to share that. I want to share that information that has made my life so awesome. Yeah. And, and that's something I know is so valuable to some of our listeners because a lot of us are, are entrepreneurs working on our side hustle, scaling our business. And, and we can't ignore the, the importance of peak performance and operating at our best. If we're trying to build something, if we're trying to find financial freedom, if we're trying to build a legacy, leave something for our families or just retire early, any of that is going to require us to show up day in and day out as we build our business, our side hustle, or our, our passive streams of income. So operating our best is important, which leads us to health and fitness and wellness and all that. And there's, there's a plethora of topics. And I know you, you have a lot of, of experience and a lot of areas we can go. But one thing that I saw while, while uh, researching you was with your experience with keto, having, I don't know how much butter in, <laughs> in your coffee at one, or oil, I've done oh. keto before, man. What was what was your experience like? Yeah, so I never. I'm not a big keto fan. I just don't think it's very sustainable. And I also make fun of people who are like, you know what I'm doing to get healthy? 500 calories with the butter in my coffee. I was like, who told you that was healthy? <laughs> you know. But one of one time, one of my clients had come in and was like, oh, I'm just having taken MCT oil in the morning. That's great. I love it. I'm like, yeah, I do that too. I do about a tablespoon. She's like, oh, I take six tablespoons. And I was like, you're a little girl. How is that possible? I'm gonna try it too. Anyways, fast forward about um, 24 hours and 17 bathroom trips. I've come to the conclusion that you don't need that much MCT oil. And you can learn from my mistakes here. I think that would be helpful for everyone involved. <laughs> now, so as someone who did did keto, um, and I, I mentioned keto because I, I wanted to start there because it's almost been looked at as, okay, this is the fat burning diet, right? And, and that's kind of when I started it. And I had some different experiences with it. I, I liked the cognitive like ignition that I got and, and, and all that. But to your point, and I did this for eight months. This wasn't like, oh, let me try it and do it. I was sustained for eight months. My girlfriend at the time, now wife, so it worked out, but she was pissed at me because <laughs> she, she made a honey chicken I couldn't eat. She, she, was, she suffered just as much as I did through this diet, but- I agree with you in terms of its lack of sustainability. And I also question, um, I do question for those that don't do it correctly, the health benefits of it, because I'm looking at some, some posts of people talking about eating bacon and cheese and, and all these high fat contents. And I, I don't understand it, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm hundred percent agree with you. I think it can be the right choice for a lot of things. You know, it was originally brought out in like the eighties as a diet that helped prevent seizures. Mm -hmm. If I had found out that I have cancer today, which, you know, knock on wood, hopefully that doesn't happen. I would go keto hundred percent right, right off the bat. But if I'm looking for a fat loss diet, I'm looking for something that's sustainable. Cause like I said before, if, if you drop 30 pounds, but you're miserable the whole time, you're going to catch that weight again. And you're not. And so what's the point of having done that white knuckled gritted it out just to drop down and come back up. We want to drop down and we want to, we want to make that the last time you drop back down. 
our body only gets so many of these things, you know, like we can only yo-yo up and down before our metabolism is just not quite functioning at a high level anymore. So we want to minimize the amount of times we're dropping, increasing, dropping, increasing. That's just not healthy for our bodies. And then to your point about saturated fats and just eating a lot of bacon and stuff, well, like beyond even just like the saturated fat aspect, which, you know, some people have been kind of saying, Hey, coconut oil, saturated fat, that's good for you. There's some saturated fats in like animal products. It's good for you. And so whether or not you like, you feel like that's a good option or not, just having so much saturated fat is not going to be ideal for heart health and longevity, especially because when you're having a lot of animal products with the fat is where most the majority of the toxins are stored. Mm. So not to say it's negative, not to say like, oh, you can't drink diet Coke and you should never have bacon. You can have all both of those things, but just knowing that having those in moderation is going to be a much better fit for your long-term health and longevity than being like, oh, I'm on keto. I should probably have a stick of butter in my coffee today. Just because you <laughs> should have do something or you could do something doesn't mean you probably like that's a good idea. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I wanted to start there with the, with the keto topic because part of me leaning into it was this it wasn't a promise, but the, the stories of prolonged energy and just the energy that you can go on and on and on, which makes that alluring to business owners, entrepreneurs, and things like that. I mean, I'd go days, man, and, and not days, but like I would eat my little, my nuts, my cheese sticks, my little meat sticks too, and everything for breakfast. And I'd sit down, I'd go to the gym, I'd work and it would be 5 PM and I'm not hungry. And I would have to force these calories down my mouth because I'm going to bed soon. But again, the allure of the keto diet is, is that energy, but how can busy professionals create energy on demand? How can we moderate our energy to be efficient and, and still successful in, in our ventures? Well, exactly what you said about keto. I, I love that aspect where you're actually teaching your body how to become fat adapted. But I think the lie that we've been sold from like, from the, like the no carb crowd, which I think no carb is, it's not something I really am into, but I like the low carb ideas mm -hmm. is that you can't ever have carbohydrates and you'll net, like, that's never a good source of energy. Ketones is a backup energy source. It's like running on the, uh, like running on your generator. But if you're fat adapted, you can have exactly what you described, all that focus and energy and mental acuity all day long. And then you can also have your carbohydrates in the evening. So if you're doing it the right way, a lot of people call the million dollar body method, the cheat cheater keto, because you're basically having proteins and fats throughout the day, but you do get to have carbohydrates at night because what we want to do is we want to teach our body how to utilize the different types of energy or different types of fuel for the right types of activities. So if you're not running a triathlon every single day or outside digging ditches, you probably don't need that many carbs to sit at your desk and to work. That's a great source. That's a great use of the of fat. It's like a low impact fuel. Mm -hmm. So if you're eating the right foods, you're teaching your body how to burn your own fat for energy. You're going to have the exact same experience. But now we just flip the switch a little bit at dinner time. So you can have your carbohydrates, refuel your glycogen stores. Glycogen exists in your liver, your muscles. And so, and it's like kind of that high impact fuel. It fuels your workouts. It fuels those long distance, like cardio bouts, those sorts of things. And it can be very, very impactful and, and helpful because now you're not having to be like, I can't eat a whole entire 30% of all the food out there by eliminating carbohydrates. And then the other thing about keto and just to not get lost too much in the weeds here is if you're all, if your body is in ketosis and then you have carbohydrates, it causes cellular damage. So if you're in keto and you're doing keto, great. If you're doing keto and you have a bagel here and then a beer there, like you're not doing yourself any favors. You're putting yourself in a negative state. So why not teach your body how to use both sources of fuel in the right way at the right times? So I'm a huge fan of, of chasing that energy because if you have energy, you can do whatever you want. You can get those workouts in. You're going to feel really good. You're going to build your business. You're going to work on the side hustle. It doesn't matter. But I think also the energy is the is the critical component that people just miss. We're looking for 20 pounds of weight loss. We're looking for abs. We don't realize that energy and cravings are, are like complementary and they are indicative of how good our body's functioning, how well our body can burn fat. So to your question about how do people create energy on demand, there's a couple of different ways to do this. Number one, fasting can be incredible here. Fasting can help your body start regulating your insulin levels, your blood sugar to make sure that you are burning fat. And it can also like, you know, as you've done on keto, I'm sure you can start seeing that like, oh, wow, when I'm fasting, I actually have a little bit more energy. I'm a little bit more like hyped up, but that's just because of a natural evolutionary mechanism where, you know, after you, you eat a big woolly mammoth, you don't want to go hunt, right? You're only mm -hmm. trying to go hunt 
when you're a little bit hungry. So when we are hungry, we kind of turn up and we can reframe our hunger signals as mental acuity, more energy. We can actually use that as in a productive way moving forward. So a couple of different ways to get energy. Number one would be having the right morning routine, getting a little bit of exercise in the morning, shifting your body right away into that sympathetic nervous system dominance. That's that like that. We call it fight or flight. Not a lot of cheetahs just running around North America. So we'll call it shake and bake instead. How about that? I like it. A little bit of that. And then we're going to we'll do a little bit of fasting and then we're going to eat light all day, minimize our carbs until dinner time. And you're going to have a ton of energy on demand. And then if they're in that moment when you're like, man, I got a podcast, I got a meeting, I got a sales call. I'm a little bit like, I don't have the energy. We got a couple of strategies for that as well. Just some physical, like quick hits, 60 seconds of doing push-ups, doing jumping jacks. That's going to shift your state completely. Man, so I did a leg workout before this interview and I oh, did yeah. not want to hit the gym. I'll be honest, I skipped the gym yesterday, which is why I had to hit it today. Um, <laughs> well, so- Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. I, I am 100% honest, but my accountability is today was my day off of the gym, but because I skipped yesterday and I've looked at my calendar and I'm like, there's no way I could sit, talk to Nate <laughs> when I'm skipping the gym day. So I went ahead, did legs today, but to your point, it, it does energize me. I got back from the gym, made my post-workout shake, and now I'm looking at the docket to record this podcast, and then and, and I'm energized, and I'm good to go. Um, when you mentioned the shake and bake, kind of getting uh, tapping into the, is it the sympathetic nervous system early right. in the morning? Um, what are some, is, is a cold shower or something a, a strategy for that? Because it sounds like what you described is, almost something I've stumbled upon through some of my experiments in terms of what works for me. My schedule, if you're not familiar or any of our new listeners aren't familiar, I wake up at 2 a.m. I work from 3 a.m. Uh, to, I work pretty much from 3 a.m. to 10.30 in the morning, 11 a.m. And then I get my workout in and then I kind of do things throughout the day. And pretty much I don't eat until noon, right after my workout, pretty much. I you do a fasted workout. I'll eat after my workout and I'll probably eat a little bit during the day and I'll have a big meal, maybe around 6.30, 7 p.m. before I go to bed uh, about an hour or so later. Now, that is just kind of how things have fallen for me, not necessarily prescribed and planned for the intentionality that you kind of laid out, but how would someone's schedule, uh, I guess, dictate how they implement some of these practices? Because maybe eating little little bits throughout the day isn't isn't feasible but what do you what would you recommend for someone to kind of manipulate for their schedule in terms of what would be beneficial for them yeah i like to talk about things in kind of in terms of breakfast lunch and dinner but you could easily re, like switch that up to being first meal second meal third meal it doesn't really matter perfect um, i'm a big fan of eliminating snacking so it doesn't it doesn't matter like what time of day just making sure that you're having two or three meals rather than rather than having little bits here and having an almond there, because every time you're pulling uh, nutrients in, you're eating some something here, you're having a handful of trail mix, your body pulls blood from your extremities and from your brain to digest that food. So if you wanna be on top of your game, have a lot of mental acuity, just eliminate any of your snacking is gonna be a great option for that. So to your, to your question, I would say doing a proteins and fats in the morning, proteins, fats, and vegetables for lunch or second meal, and then proteins, vegetables, and carbohydrates for your last meal of the day before you go to bed is optimal to work with your body's natural biorhythms and circadian rhythms to help you wake up, have a lot of energy, burn fat all day, and then use those carbohydrates as a supplement to basically help you improve your recovery and help you sleep better at night. By the way, what time are you going to sleep to wake up at 2 a.m.? Eight. Yikes, bro. Yeah, I need to make better better life choices. <laughs> Well, so which is, I think the, the, the audience gets to see my vulnerability. They know I keep it 100 on the podcast. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie to the audience because this is just as beneficial to me as a host as it is for the audience. So I appreciate your expertise there. And, and you kind of touched on my next question with the carbs, because I was going to ask, okay, what's the best supplement for sleep recovery and, and performance in the following days? Is it the carbohydrates late and what recommendations to my schedule <laughs> would you have for me to get better sleep? Yeah, I would definitely uh, sleep more. It's probably one of my top recommendations for you. Just like 
you know, extend that window out. It's probably one of the best things you can do, but yeah, for your, but uh, the, one of the best things you can do before you go to sleep to recover, to rebuild, to repair is having some carbohydrates. So we're going to use carbohydrates, which are naturally a, like, will slow you down. You know, you have Thanksgiving dinner and you're like, wow, it's all the tryptophan. And you're like, well, no, there's no tryptophan in the six, six servings of mashed potatoes I just had. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to make sure that you're using that as a way of sleeping better and recovering better because you're, like I said, you're burning out all your glycogen stores all day. You're burning through your fat all day. So now we get to kind of replenish that. So your body is not necessarily turning into a sugar burner. Like what happens when most people, they eat a bagel in the morning, you burn that off. You eat, a, you eat something for lunch, you burn it off. We don't want to be consistently burning out the food we're eating. We want to be burning off our stored energy. So our last in first out, kind of like think about the milk at a grocery store. You don't want to like take the milk out and then someone sneaks up and puts the new milk in the front and all the old milk is just sitting there in the back. That's not good for the smells. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we want to treat our body in a, in a similar way where we're giving our chance to burn off the stored fat first and then, but still using carbohydrates in the, in the PM to repair and rebuild. Plus most of us are doing client dinners. We have dinners with our family, you know? And so if you show up at a client dinner and you just have like, like a little asparagus, a little salmon, you're like, I'm doing keto right now. People are like, what? <laughs> you know? So I want to be able to be like, you want people to have a chance to eat a baked potato or have a glass of wine, you know, like life is too short to be like completely white knuckling and just so, so disciplined where you never can in, eat or break bread with friends and family. So in, in that, in that instance, like I think of, I think of like, what again is sustainable? What are my clients dealing with? What are they, what, like, what is going to cause them to trip up and client dinners and like just kind of struggling in the PM is the biggest thing. So if you can keep your, your day low calorie, high protein, high fat, but like, but no carbohydrates at all. You have to have a lot more wiggle room, a lot more flexibility in the PM to have a bigger meal with more carbs and use that in a productive way rather than being like, oh no, I screwed up again. Yeah. So let's talk about timing with this because um, I mean, I have a coworker of mine who's exploring intermittent fasting. I, I've done it for quite some time and, and it's worked for me mainly because of my schedule. I'm so busy in the morning. I usually don't get the opportunity to eat until after work. And when you say morning, you're still talking about 2 a.m.? I'm still talking about 2 a.m. <laughs> so I'll wake up at 2 a.m. My first meal is usually in the afternoon by everyone's definition, uh, 12, 1230 p.m. Um, that's usually when my first meal is. And I'll eat up until about an hour before I go to bed. Um, so shifting my, my window a little bit will probably have to shift my window when I eat. But... Um, the timing of when we eat food is, is there, is there a benefit to intermittent fasting? Do you recommend spacing out the meals all day? What do you think is the best approach or is it kind of uh, individual to however someone's schedule might be laid out? I think it is individual. And I think you got to find out what works for you. Um, I was, I was big in intermittent fasting doing 16 and eight. I did that for about 18 months. I had some great success on it. But the main thing that I found, especially for myself and for my busy clients is that their lunch would turn into this really big meal. And if lunch was a big meal, then they were sluggish and slow in the afternoon. And in the afternoon is when the time when you need to check boxes, we need to get stuff done. We need to get like, knock things off our to-do list. So it's not, a, it's not an effective use of our time to try to fit two hours worth of work into four hours, you know? And like, you're just kind of never like being incredibly effective with it. So eating, having a better, like a bigger breakfast, a lighter lunch is it is going to give you this like kind of slow release, time release energy all day long to get you handling all the stuff that you need to do without having a big spike of insulin and blood sugar. That's going to slow you down. So, um, I think inter intermittent fasting can be good, but my preference is prolonged fasting. I love a 24 to 72 hour fast, 48 hours going to be in that sweet spot once a week, once every other week, especially if you're in a fat loss stage, like think about, think about that. You're pulling out like two sevenths, 30, 30% or so of your daily, of your weekly calories in just one shot. Like, so if you wanted to eat pizza and Cinnabon, like you just have a little bit more flexibility to do those things. You want to have a beer here or there. Like you can, you can do that with the flexibility that fasting gives you. Furthermore, a 24 hour fast gives you the autophagy benefits, kind of like the metabolism boosting, the hormonal effects of three and a half, 16 hour fasts. So in uh -huh. one 24 hours period, you can get three and a half days worth of fasting benefit if you're doing the intermittent style. So I think that's great. And then like 
kind of on top of the physical benefits and the hormonal benefits, there's a mental benefit too of getting through a 24 hour fast where you just don't get with a 16 hour fast. Mm -hmm. Cause you look at yourself and you go 24 hours, 40 hours. That's a long time. Can, like, can I do it? And then you do it and you're like, yes, I got it done. And it builds this mental fortitude and strength because it's like, it's binary, right? It's eat or don't eat. It's not like, well, you could eat and maybe you should have like some, avoid some sugar and then try not to do too much of this where we start, like we're, we're the best animals in the entire world at rationalizing and wrapping our head around stuff like that. So if we can give ourselves binary, like on or off, yes or no type triggers, it makes life so much easier. So that's why I really prefer that type of fasting and the people who have tried it just kind of, they'll, they won't go back to it because they just, it's, it just gives them so much freedom to have that, that piece of discipline every week. Yeah, no, I like that. And uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of folks know there's no such thing as just one chip or just a little bit. <laughs> what do you start? Nope. You're, you're, nope. you're going down the deep Especially end. if it's that salt and vinegar chips. That's oh, no, no, no such thing as one chip you yeah. break. It's not going to work. Um, so we've talked a lot about like the nutrient aspect, but I, I want to talk about the, the physical training and, and, and the fitness behind it. And there's a difference between, uh, I guess, exercise and training. What's the difference and what's probably uh, more of an ideal situation or selection for somebody who is looking to perform, operate at a high level and, and consistently stick to this routine? You know, one thing I love that you said earlier is that you're trying to, your goals include to look good naked and to be hard to kill. Oh yeah. And I think that if your goals at all include looking good naked, you want to incorporate some aspect of training rather than just exercise. Exercise, that's boot camp classes, that's riding the Peloton, that's movement. And movement is great. And if you like to do those things, amazing. If you go on walks, amazing. That's great. But training is a different animal. And training is how we get results, especially physically. Now, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of training. I was a personal trainer for until like 2015, I did a lot of stuff in person and I'm primarily online now, which because it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. So what I've found is that if people want to get results like and look different, change the way their body looks and feels, you got to start with the foundation of nutrition and lifestyle. But once you have that in place, training gets added on as a way of getting consistent, measurable progress with your exercises. So like, let's say you're squatting hundred pounds, Ted. Um, next week, you better be able to squat. If you squat it for 10 times, 10 times this week, you need to be able to squat it for 11 times next week or squat 105 pounds for 10 times. And if you can start putting like that little progressive overload, those pieces into play, then you're going to see results. Your body can literally not help, but to give you results because you're always pushing it a little bit more. So even if you start a little lower than your, your absolute max, if you're insistent on progress every single workout and you have a reliable way of measuring and tracking that, that's training. And you're going to see those physical results way faster than someone who's just hitting a boot camp class here, doing a Zumba class there, hitting a TRX workout, going to the gym, being like, what should I do today? That's not training. And that's a great way to just like, just basically exist in fitness purgatory. That's why yeah. you see so many people in the, in the gym who look the same year after year after year after year, because they don't have a plan and they don't re record their results. Man, my buddy used to always say he was a trainer all, all the time. And I forgot whose quote it was, but he says, what gets measured gets managed. And I've been in the gym for a long time. And I can say the period in which I've seen the most growth, the most amount of strength that I built over the shortest amount of time was... <laughs> I used to make fun of the guys walking around with a little notebook and like writing, writing it down. But I had an Excel spreadsheet that I, that uh, my friend actually made. And every week I would, I would log the weight, the reps, how many I did. And then the following week, I would just turn it up a little bit, turn it up a little bit, turn it up a little bit. Nate, after about eight weeks, <laughs> I had it all. I had all the improvements. I was doing bench presses of 225. I didn't think I'd be able to do. Uh, and, and all that. What did you just show? I, I'd love for our, uh, our folks watching on YouTube to see that again and have you explain yeah, it. So this is the app that I use. So I use this personally. I'll have my clients all using this one. But basically, like I'll have the rep, the sets and reps here. You record your weights on the side. And then up top, it's hard to see, but you can see last time you did these weights. Hmm. So this time, if you want to do better, you have to, you know what you have to beat. So you, it always gives you that that metric. So you can always take that next step. You can always do a little bit better because you have to know, like you have to have the logbook or the Excel sheet or the app or whatever it takes 
So that way you can track your progress over time. Cause if you don't, then you're, you're going to be the guy benching 185 for the next five years. And you're never going to get to that 225. And that's yeah. not what we want. You know, like that's not why you're in the gym. So it's like, a, it like turns this great activity into kind of a, a waste. Mm -hmm. I'm coming back from an injury, man. I touched 315 on squats for the first time in about four or five months today. I'm so you have to let me know how that is. I uh, feel like that's, that's just something I look at and I go, maybe not for me. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know how much you weigh, but it's all relative because I'm like one, 185 now. And I think that's, that's as high as I need to go. Um, we're coming up on some of our, our, our last few minutes here on the podcast. And um, one thing I wanted to touch on something that you, that you had in the notes when I was looking over um, was insulin resistance. And, and I was curious to know exactly what is insulin resistance because, and what is, how is it killing us slowly? I, I'd love to kind of put some light on that for our listeners really quick. A lot of people think that like, oh, now we're starting to talk about insulin or blood sugar. Like I can kind of zone out. That's for people with diabetes. But this is something that impacts all of us. And especially if you have any designs on having high energy, it's something you want to pay attention to. So basically insulin is the counterpart to blood sugar. Blood sugar comes in, your body raises insulin levels, and it'll take that blood sugar and put it in the appropriate spaces. Insulin is like a key. It opens, the, it opens cells up for you. So whether it's a fat cell or a muscle cell, and that is dictated by how good your body is at processing carbohydrates and insulin. So what happens when you get insulin resistant, and I'll, I'll give you a quick, easy way to determine if you're, if you're in that de demographic or not. Um, simply take a, take a measuring tape, measure your waist at the belly button, and then divide that by your height. So divide it in inches and inches. And if that number is above 0 0.47 waist divided by height, then you have some degree of insulin resistance. It's a scale, it's not binary. So it's kind of like, as it comes down, if you get to that 0.46, you're doing really good. Your body is what's called insulin sensitive. So what happens is like, especially like just kind of describing like a typical day for someone, you know, you have the standard American diet. We have in the morning, we have a bagel or a banana or something like that. So what happens is our blood sugar goes up, our insulin comes up to meet it. But if we're insulin resistant, it probably goes a little bit higher. Now our blood sugar comes back down we still have some insulin in our system. So our body sends a message to our hormones, ghrelin, and it says, yo, let's get some food. Let's get some sugar. What are you doing? And you're like, didn't I just eat? Why am I so hungry at 10 o'clock? Mm. Body's like, get those, eat six blueberries. And you're like, a donut? Okay, sure. So then blood sugar goes back up, insulin comes up, and then back down. So all day long, our body is out of, out of whack. We are not in a place of like homeostasis. So we're always asking ourselves, hey, let's get some more food. I'm having some cravings. And then if you're the more cravings you're having, that's why you're also getting tired at 1030, getting tired at 3 p.m., getting tired at nine o'clock before you get to bed. You're going into the refrigerator and you're like, what should I eat for like for a snack? I'm so hungry. And you're like, what well, didn't I just eat dinner? And then like the fifth time you go in there, you're like, I'll just have the butt of this piece of this bread and then old cheese. Like your standard just gets lower and lower and lower every time. <laughs> And that are, these are all symptoms of insulin resistance because your body is just not processing those, that sugar well enough to, to give you this nice, easy, smooth energy. Now, if you have, if your waist height ratio is 0.46, you're going to be able to get away with having a bagel for breakfast without a lot of deleterious effects. Like a lot of people will have, but if you don't have that and you're noticing your cravings, your cravings are up and your energy is down, there's a severe, there's something that you need to fix. Um, and then the easiest way to do that is by fasting and eliminating sugars for a week or so. Nice. I think <laughs> you just found a solution to something my wife has been going through for months, if not over a year, like, why am I hungry? If I just ate, <laughs> maybe fasting might be the solution. One of the last questions I want to ask Nate is, oh, go ahead, please. All you, um, what got you into all this? What was, I guess, the spark that had you start this journey into pouring into others and helping them attack these these challenges in life of reaching a peak performance, fat loss, increasing fitness, and crushing goals. So there's, there's two main events that I would kind of point to. Number one was when I was 12 years old, my mom had taken my two younger sisters to school and I was at home by myself and someone broke into the house and came in the back door. I grabbed a steak knife out of the knife block and I went and I hid under my bed and all I remember is this guy coming down the hallway, just boots on hardwood and then pounding on my door. And I remember thinking, well, that's it for me. It's been a good run, 12 years. Guess mm -hmm. I'll die now. I didn't die. Spoiler alert. Still I'm here. Happy still. 
<laughs> so, and I remember at that moment thinking like, you know, how, how do I avoid having losing my power like that again? How do I avoid this, like this fear and these like horrible, like icky emotions that I was feeling? I was like, you know what it's going to take? Bigger biceps, more neck tattoos. That's the ticket. So I kind of, that's kind of started me on that, like looking at physical culture is like running away from fear. Right. And I think that whether or not people have had that kind of like a traumatic experience like that, or, you know, someone said something about your weight, or you have just been feeling really self-conscious. A lot of times our journeys start off by running away from something that we're afraid of, or that we don't want. And that's fine. That's a great place to start. We want to make sure that we eventually turn that into like chasing something positive. But if you, if you need to run from fear to get, to get started, then more power to you. The second event was in 2018 when I um, was working with a client here in uh, Arizona. He was building a business and he's like, listen, man, I got about 40 pounds to lose. I'm not going to lose it. I'm not going to work out. I drive my truck 12 hours a day. I'm doing roofing and I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat um, fast food five times per week. He's like, but my energy is horrible. I drink three energy drinks per day. Um, and I'm going to get home to my, see my family at 6 PM. I have no energy for my kids. I got to watch sports center for like 30 minutes before I can talk to them. He's like, what do you have for me? <laughs> what do you have for me? I'm not working out. I was like, okay, let me think about it. So I came, that's when I kind of came up with this pattern, like this framework, because the million dollar body is not a diet. It's a framework. You can apply Mediterranean or paleo or whatever else you want to this framework. Um, but it's just basically like, how do you think about food in a way that's going to improve your energy and work with your body's natural biorhythms? Hmm. So gave him this plan, came up with this, like, it was like, do, do these sorts of things, eat this when you go to fast food, cheer your choices you can make. And then fast forward two months, I was like, Hey man, how's it going? And he's like, it's so good. My energy is way better. My wife's noticing a huge difference. I feel so great when I get home to see my kids. And I was like, that's incredible. Like, that's exactly what you're we looking for. Like what's next for you? He's like, hold up. I also lost 22 pounds in the last two months. Whew. And I was like, sheesh, that's <laughs> awesome. So like, and that was at that point, I was like, Hey, maybe there's a correlation between seeking energy first as our primary goal and being able to actually have the, the physique the, and like the leanness and the health that we want. And the more I've dived into the research, the more I've seen time and time again, this insulin resistance being one of these big precursors to diabetes, chronic disease, arthritis, um, obesity, all these things. And we can take care of it preemptively by literally just focusing on your energy, make sure you feel better throughout the day. But people don't talk about this because you know what sells is drop 10 pounds, lose your gut. And so I'll be lying to you if I tell you I didn't talk about detoxes and losing your gut and belly fat and visceral fat. I talk about all that stuff because what I want is to get as many people into my universe as possible. And then I go, hey, here it is. Here's what it takes, you know, mm -hmm. sell the sizzle, deliver that steak though. You know, I need people to understand how to think about nutrition in a different way. There's so much noise out there, Ted. So many people talking about stuff and they're trying to sell you a cleanse. They're trying to sell you a detox, skinny wraps. Your aunt Ruth is like, I'm doing this tea now. You know, it's like, yeah. Who do you believe? Or who do you listen to? And that's why I wrote this book. A lot of coaches do like, Hey, it's a book, but it's also like a long form sales letter. And if you buy, if you go, if you buy my program, uh, then I'll give you the rest of it. I didn't do that. I just gave it all away. I got a program. You can, I, I'll write your workouts and your meal plans and stuff like that, but just grab the book and look at it. Cause I want it in 10 years, 20 years from now, I just want to pick that up and be like, yo, this works. This mm -hmm. is giving me the results that I've been looking for. So yeah. If someone's looking Thanks to learn how to TED talk, <laughs> yeah, anytime. Um, if someone's looking to maybe eat some fish, you can give the fish, but you're also writing that book so they can learn how to fish for themselves and have those resources and tools to acquire that and and really kind of build that future themselves. That's what it's it, about. Man. That's what yeah. it's about. Well, I'd love for our audience to have an ability to connect with you, follow up with you, get the book if they want to kind of implement that as well. Um, how can they? Should, connect we, should we give it away for free? I, mean, give it to them? I, think, I mean, if you want, I mean, I think they'd enjoy it. Why don't we just give it away for free then? Don't, don't play with me now. <laughs> uh, let's just do it. Oh, uh, okay. So, <laughs> so if you want, if you want to connect with me, you can find me at million dollar body method on Instagram. Um, I run an amazing Facebook community called lose your gut, eat more tacos, never track calories. Um, you can get there by going to n8 training systems.com slash group. Hey, and if you want a free copy of the book, just go to n8trainingsystems.com slash book, and you can download the Kindle version or the, the PDF completely for free. If you're like, no, I want to pay for it. It's on Amazon. Pay for it. Leave me a review. I'd love you forever. But man, if you just want to check it out, if you're like, I don't know about this guy. He's kind of got a man bun. Not interested in that. Just go get the book for free. You know, if you don't like it, I'll give you your money back. I love it, man. Well, I appreciate your generosity. And when it comes <laughs> to the group, you had me at tacos. 
I mean, I probably consume tacos at least once a week. Oh man, we're going to be friends. Oh yeah. Mainly on Tuesdays, but you know, I don't discriminate. I'll do it from Thursdays, any day that ends in line. Oh, same, tacos. same. And um, man, Nate, this, this was valuable. This was fun. And uh, I know the listeners not only had a good time, but they got a lot of value. So I appreciate you taking the time to, to share with us today, man. Absolutely. This is a lot of fun, Ted. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to recap some of the things you said really quick. And uh, as I sign us off here, because um, something that you said, and I always encourage folks to sign up for our Patreon page for as little as $1 a month, you can get some extra content. And something you said in that was how there was, a, was it a 95%, uh, was it, I guess, retrain or retention rate in terms of uh, putting- I say recidivism on? rate, and oh, recidivism. primarily because that's a fun word to say. It is a fun word. 95% recidivism rate. Did I get that right? Should we really be giving this information out or should they sign up for the Patreon? Uh, they should sign up for the Patreon, but yeah. that was an amazing stat. And that's just the tip <laughs> of the iceberg. So if that's not a good sell for you guys to join the Patreon, I don't know what it is, but even further, uh, minimize fluctuation. The, the more we yo-yo and put our weight up and down, we're impacting our metabolism. So as Nate said, maybe the lifestyle is a better approach than the diet. The diet might be short-lived, but the lifestyle is going to be connected with the why and what you're doing and more long-lasting. And the weight that you lose, you will never find again because you are now living in that new realm. Uh, fat adapted is good, but fat reliant and uh, resist, uh, I guess, relying on the fat, not so much. I, I love how Nate was mentioning, and correct me if I'm wrong, you said kind of uh, high protein, high fat for, for breakfast, lunch, and then late in the day is when you implement the carbs. And that car the carbs helpful for rest, recovery, performance in, in, in the next day. So all these things that you can use to manipulate and get the best performance from the food that you're eating because it is fuel that feeds our bodies. Uh, fasting, uh, we hunt when we're a little hungry. I think the way Nate explained that was, was perfect because as someone who fasts, I, I do get that odd sensation where you know that little grumble in the stomach also, it also kind of inhibits blood flow and I do feel more alert and I'm kind of more and more getting after it because I'm hungry. Some people call it hangry. I think that's just because they haven't learned how to aim that energy yet. Um, also extend sleep. Nate hit it on the, on the reel when he looked at me and just said, damn, man, <laughs> looks like I need to focus on my sleep a little bit more. And if you don't get as much sleep as I do, then maybe you really need to focus it on well. And, uh, and of course, a one 24 hour fast. I know you also mentioned the 48 hour fast, but the benefits of one 24 hour fast, was it three 16 hour fast equivalent? Three and a half three and a half, 16 hour fast equipment. I was listening, but I guess not that well, but man, just the benefits of one 24 hour fast and the mental fortitude that you build by doing it. And my notes go on and on, but training over exercise, exercise is movement, which is good, but training is where the progress comes into play. And if you're like me, when you see the progress, it gets addicting because you want to see how far you can go. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Nate, this was a lot of fun and man, I'd love to keep up with you. And, uh, and find out what you're working on and maybe have you back on the on the show one day. Yeah, let's talk about it. And then just like, just in case anyone here is kind of on the fence about the Patreon, like what we covered in that kind of the extra content, just like completely the keys to the kingdom, just giving away like all the secrets. Oh, I can't, <laughs> incredible, incredible. <laughs> I appreciate you kind of giving that so generously. And I know our Patreon subscribers and, and our loyalists are, are going to enjoy it as well. So if anybody's on the other side of that fence, we'd love for you guys to join the party. But Nate, man, this was great. Thank you so much. And as I always say, guys, if you resonated with this episode, you enjoyed it. The best compliment you can give us is sharing this with somebody else. Share this with someone you know who can benefit from this episode as well. Leave us a rating and let us know how we're doing because that's the only way we, we can improve. I need to know what you like. I need to know what you don't like. And that's how we grow the podcast together. And I promise you, I am reading those ratings and accepting that feedback. Yeah, also, but it better guys, be five stars. Just oh, yeah. say that right now. I mean, your episode gets five stars. The host yeah, might get like, like let's just get it. Let's just get them all five stars. You know what I mean? I like it. I like it. <laughs> otherwise, I'll, otherwise, I'm going to have to come over there. Oh, yeah. Don't make Nate leave Arizona. <laughs> no, it's too nice here right now. You wouldn't like that. Oh, yeah. And guys, honestly, if you did get value from this, it really would mean 
the world to us if you subscribe so you can get a new episode each and every single week. And if you haven't been sold on the Patreon page already, go ahead and join that for as little as $1 a month to get extra audio from Nate and some of the other guests that we've had on. Nate, I, I put up some foot like, picks in there too, so I think that'll be helpful. Dude, that's awesome. You're not supposed to tell them that though. <laughs> I'm just trying I'm just trying to just let everybody know what you're going to get. Yeah. <laughs> and you're not going to believe what Ted put on there. Oh my goodness. That's insane. <laughs> insane. Once you opt in though, you'll get you'll get it. You'll believe oh, it. Yeah. Now. Oh yeah. Only for a dollar a month too. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Nate, I think you're going to like this sign off though because we always say this at the end of the episode and it's just oh so real and it's a life motto of mine. Everybody wants the sunshine, but they don't want the rain. But the truth is, you can't get the pleasure without going through the pain. Let's grow.